Thank you, Father Dave. Uh, and thank you for coming out and coming to this retreat uh, to refresh yourselves so you could be, be a blessing to, uh, to all those you serve. And um, uh, Father Dave makes it sound like, uh, uh, like they had to twist my arm or something like that uh, to make time for this conference. But um, it is such a delight uh, for me. Uh, I never turn down the opportunity to be able to talk to priests uh, because I love the priesthood and um, was myself a Protestant pastor for a number of years, love the ministry of preaching. And I know that you fathers are out on the front line and anything I could possibly do to give some encouragement um, to you that are fighting and slogging it out in spiritual battle day by day, uh, on behalf of the church militant, um, I want to be able to do that and to, to be part of uh, the encouragement process. So it's a real delight for me to, uh, to be with you this morning. And uh, we've got a great topic. We're going to be talking about Jesus as the face of the Father. Let's begin in prayer in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Heavenly Spirit, fall down on us now. Heavenly Father, send the Spirit to anoint our hearts and to anoint these words and to open our eyes and our hearts that uh, our hearts may burn as those men who walked on the road to Emmaus as you broke open the scriptures to them. Help us to see what it means that the Son is the face of the Father and help us uh, to, uh, to assimilate that and to let it grow and shape who we are as men who seek after your heart. We ask this through Christ our Lord and in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. So I'd like to begin this morning. Hopefully you have um, the handout. And our main text is going to be from John 14. During the Last uh, Supper discourse. And our Lord said to the twelve, Let not your hearts be troubled, Believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many rooms. If it were not so, would I have told you that I go to prepare a place for you? And when I go to prepare a place for you, I will come again and will take you to myself, that where I am, you may be also. And you know the way where I am going. And Thomas said to him, Lord, we don't know where you're going. How can we know the way? Jesus said to him, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father but by me. If you had known me, you would have known my Father also. Henceforth you know him and have seen him. <laughs> Philip said to him, Lord, show us the Father and we shall be satisfied. Jesus said to him, have I been with you so long and yet you do not know me, Philip? He who has seen me has seen the Father. How can you say, show us the Father? It's from this text and others similar that we often speak of our Lord as being the face of the Father. As he says, he who has seen me has seen the Father. And um, Pope Emeritus Benedict um, reflected on this passage and on the idea of Jesus as face of the Father in several of his audiences which you can find if you just Google Benedict XVI, uh, Face of the Father, you'll find uh, two or three audiences in which he reflected on this profound theme. This text has a lot of meaning to me because uh, of my personal history with one of my uh, best friends in the course of my life. A very close friend uh, from high school, in fact. Uh, in high school, of course, I was a Protestant um, my father was a Navy chaplain, uh, but one of my closest friends was Catholic, and a devout Catholic, a uh, lector, and stayed faithful to, uh, to the moral teaching of the church, um, did not use bad language, fasted during Lent, the whole, th the whole Catholic lifestyle, even in a very secular environment in Hawaii as uh, we were growing up. Unfortunately, after high school, we went our separate ways, and different things happened to me, and different things happened to him. 
Uh, about 15 years later, I ended up coming into the Catholic Church while I was at the University of Notre Dame, and one of the first things I wanted to do was get back in contact with my good friend uh, from earlier in my life and give him the good news that I had seen the light and uh, come over. And so I tracked him down and sent a message, and oh my goodness, when I got the reply, it was very cool, and I thought, in, in the sense of, you know, at arm's distance. And I thought, uh-oh, something has happened. And sure enough, in those intervening 15 years, I came into the church and he went out. And uh, we had various discussions. And um, uh, at one point, we were exchanging uh, letters back and forth and talking about the faith. And he wrote to me and he said, he quoted this verse, um, I am the way, the truth, life. No one comes to the Father but by me. And he said, I reject the salvation offered by Jesus Christ because it is exclusive. It excludes other people, right? It's too arrogant. And of course, that hit me pretty hard, right? It's one of two times in my life where I've um, witnessed a a person, uh, a friend up close, Uh, explicitly reject uh, our Lord, and it's a very disturbing experience. But I'm grateful for this. His response caused me to think about this text and to really ask the question, is Jesus arrogant because he says, I am the way to the Father? Is Jesus arrogant because he says, he who has seen me has seen the Father? Is that just a a pride trip? Is that kind of a religious chauvinism that you and I, you know, go around and saying, our our leader is better than your leader. Our leader knows the true way and you guys all have false ways, you know. Is that just a matter of uh, our own um, hubris? But after uh, years of pondering this, it began to come to me why it's not. Because let's look closely at what our Lord says. He does not say, I am the way to God, in some general sense, or he who has seen me has seen God, but I am the way to the Father. And there's a distinction. Because our Lord is the only founder of a world religion who teaches us that God is Father. Now that strikes a lot of people as strange in America because we just assume that, say, Islam is some kind of modification like Christianity. It's like basically like Christianity except they got five laws instead of the Ten Commandments and so on, you know. This is what my plumber told me uh, uh, when he was working on my house. He graduated from another Catholic university, which will will remain nameless, and... uh, so we're talking about religion, like, oh, yeah, I, you know, 12 years of Catholic school. I went to such and such a uh, university from a different religious order that shall remain nameless. And, um, and he says, oh, yeah, the, the Muslims are just like us. You know, we got the Ten Commandments. They've got the five pillars of Islam, blah, 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 right? So we assume that all these other religions, they're, they're all teaching the way to the Father. No. No. So let's talk about the founders of other world religions. Muhammad does not teach that God is a father. In fact, it's dogma in Islam that God is not a father and God has no children. Outright rejection of the revelation of the father. Buddha, to many American surprise, was not even a theist. He was an agnostic about the existence of God. For him, the existence of God was not the main matter of concern. For the the Buddha, the matter of concern was to liberate your soul from the cycles of reincarnation. And so he taught a path of virtue and uh, temperance and mortification, etc., that would enable you to break the cycles of reincarnation. But as to whether there was a God or not, that was a matter that he never came down firmly on. Now, subsequently, you know, centuries and centuries later, Buddha got virtually divinized by some of his followers, but that's not what he taught. 
And we could go on and on. You know, Confucius. Confucius didn't really set up a religion. And he too was an agnostic about God. Lao Tzu, founder of Taoism in China. Another big world religion, at least in China. God is just kind of a force, like in Star Wars. You know, and you die and you get back, absorbed back into the force. And it's like that for many Eastern religions, which some of which are kind of polytheistic on the front end and pantheistic on the back end. So by the time you sort it all out, God is just this force. So it's surprising. I was actually surprised. Went through, checking out, getting books and checking out the world. Our Lord is the one, the only one, the only founder of a faith who claims not just that God is like a father. You get that in a few. But that he is father. So that's what our faith offers. Our faith offers to the world the way to God as Father. Not the way to break the cycles of incarnation, not the way to submit to Allah, the master of the universe, but the way to God as Father. That is the good news. That's why it is good news. To find that the basis of all reality is one who loved you so much that he sent his son for your salvation. Not somebody else, not creating a demigod, not sending an angel, okay? not showing you some path that did not involve sacrifice for himself, but loved you so much, he sent his son for your salvation. That is the offer of Christianity. So when you line up the world religions in the, in the marketplace, okay, we're selling different fruit. If you want the apples of Allah, they're down there, okay? If you want the kumquats of Buddhism, they're down there. We're selling bananas, okay? (laughs) And we're the only booth in the whole marketplace selling bananas, okay? If you're the only one selling bananas, it's not arrogant to say, I'm the only banana vendor. I am the only way to bananas. Okay. That's not arrogance. It's just a statement of fact. That religion offers you this. That religion offers you that. If that's what you're into, go. But if you want the way to the Father, that's what we're selling. If you want the way to the Father, the only way to the Father is through Jesus Christ. Can I get an amen? Amen. Thank you. Can I get another? One more for the Holy Trinity. Thank you. The only way to the Father is through Jesus Christ. Not arrogance. It's a statement of fact. Our Lord is the only one who teaches that God is a Father. Some other religions might say that there's a Father like God. But not a God who sent His Son as a sacrifice for our sins, not a God who is simply like a father, but is father. A God who is the essence of fatherhood, from which human fatherhood is just kind of like a rough approximation. That is unique. Not Allah, not Vishnu, not Brahman. None of those are the Father. And so this is how Jesus shows us the face of the Father. When we see Jesus for who he really is, the Son sent from the Father who loves us, then we begin to understand the heart of the Father. You know, we look at the cross, and it's very common to say we look at the cross and we see the love of Jesus on the cross, or we see the love of Jesus in the crucifix. But you know what? Also in the cross and in the crucifix, we see the love of the Father. And I wish that was stated more commonly. I wish we taught that more. The love of the Father. Because you know what? A lot of our kids in CCD and whatnot, you know what they're thinking? I think like, Jesus loves us, but the Father was mad. You know? The Father wanted to zap us. You know, and Jesus said, no, 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 zap me. The father zapped him and said, what kind of notion of God is that? What kind of understanding the nature of God? That's not how it was. Okay? 
we almost have, we almost have a perverse notion of what divine fatherhood is. It's, it's only a psychopathic father okay, that delights in harming his son. Okay. For a true father, no, look, for a true father, okay, a true father would rather suffer than watch his son undergo suffering. And we've not let that percolate adequately in, in our spiritual psyche. Okay. Uh, two of my sons uh, were born with double cleft upper palate. A uh, condition that basically meant uh, they came forth from the womb without a roof on, uh, on their mouth. And uh, then a, a, a kind of profound uh, bisection of, uh, of the upper jaw. And uh, for that condition, you have to have surgery fairly quickly, within six months, uh, to start doing repair on the lip. And then after a year, uh, you do work on uh, the palate. And uh, so I've been through this uh, with uh, two sons, going in with a six-month-old son, and you're going to put him under for surgery. And uh, the problem is, since they're six months, you can't communicate to them what's going on. You can't explain to them that this is for their ultimate good or that everything's going to be okay. All right. So when you give the child over to the nurse and the child is looking at you, what's going on? You know? And you're waving bye-bye to your baby and in goes your son into the OR. Right? And then you wait. And uh, I was a little bit better prepared for this the second time, but the first time uh, when I was taken back post-operative, and saw my son for the first time, uh, it, white as a sheet, okay, with uh, with the stitching, and uh, on the face, and uh, yeah, um, the poor little baby boy there. Um, uh, I started to get lightheaded. I started to go down, <laughs> and uh, nurses run run up, grab my arm, you know, help me down into a chair. I would have much rather gone into the OR myself. Sign me up right now, okay? Well, Mr. Bergsman will let you take the surgery and said, yep, <laughs> I'll do that. Thank you, no problem, okay? Much rather than watch the son go through that. Now, we don't want to be patripassionists, right? We know it's a, it's, it's a formal heresy to say the father suffered on the cross. But it's a divine mystery, something that, John Paul II explored. What is this mystery of the suffering of the Father? Because there's language that suggests grief in the heart of the Father in, in the Bible. And so this is a great mystery to us. But in the gift of Christ on the cross, behind that scene, we have insight into the heart of the Father who was willing to make a greater sacrifice than self-sacrifice the sacrifice to see his only beloved son be rejected, suffer curse, suffer, re, suffer punishment on behalf of the sins of his adopted children. That, fathers and brothers, is a profound mystery. When we gaze on the cross, we see the heart of the love of the Father in a way that cannot be comprehended. Also, in the face of Christ on the cross, we come to a knowledge of who God is. Without the coming of Christ, we would, we would know a lot of what God is, okay? Uh, but we would not know who God is. Looking on our sheets here, St. Paul tells us, what can be known about God uh, through natural reason without revelation, right? Romans 1.20, famous verse. Ever since the creation of the world, his invisible nature, namely his eternal power and deity, has been clearly perceived in the things that have been made, so they are without excuse. And St. Paul goes on to enumerate the sins of humanity. So St. Paul insists, by natural reason, by looking at the sky and the universe, we could come to a knowledge of what God is. You know, 
eternally powerful, omniscient, omnipresent. But that's a description, okay? That's not a face. That's a description, like the police out in Steubenville looking for me, right? Looking for a suspect, Caucasian, 170 pounds, blonde, blue. No. That might be enough for them to find me and about 15 other guys. But that's a far cry from a face, right? So looking upon creation, looking at natural reason, it gives us, you know, uh, a, a dispatcher description of what divinity we're looking for. Looking for a suspect, omniscient, omnipresent. Okay. Omnipotent. But it doesn't give us a face, does it? And we want more than just a description. We want a face. See, it, there's one good thing about the German language, which I had to study in college. German language makes a distinction between ways of knowing. So if you know a subject matter, that's Wissen. Okay? Wissenschaft. That's science. Wissenschaftlicher. That's scientific. So, all my Bible scholarship from the Germans was Wissenschaftlicher. You can have it. Anyway, that's Wissen. If you know a person, that's Kennen. So you'd never say, I, ich weiße Joe. No, you'd say, ich weiße Theologie. You know, I know theology. But if you know Joe, then ich kenne Joe. Okay? This is personal knowledge. Right? And from nature, we can get this in about God. But can it about God, personal knowledge, that comes through Jesus Christ. And in the scriptures, Jesus Christ is the one who gives us the face of God that goes with the name of God. And, you know, to really know someone, you need to know both their name and their face, don't you? You know, this is the real, this is the real problem for me. The first five years of teaching here, from like 04 to 09, I can remember all of my students. You know, they'd come in and they were like, they're all engraved on my heart. You know. The sixth year in the fall, I walked into class. I looked at 60 new freshmen in PBS 1 survey of Old Testament. And I could almost physically feel a little spring go Pow! in my brain. And the little guy in the brain who like files things said, I quit. <laughs> Not going to do this anymore. <laughs> You're on your own now. Okay. And I just have not been able to keep up since. I can't keep faces straight. I see students that look like former students. Sarah, no, Christy, no. <laughs> and stuff like that. So I can't, I have such trouble keeping it. And I'm sure you experience this. I'm sure you try to learn all your parishioners' names. And, and periodically there's something, hi, Father, you know. I remember when you confirmed me or baptized me. No, you wouldn't remember when you baptized. But I don't know. I remember something about you. And you're like, oh, who is this? And you're real kind, and they walk away, and as you're walking back to your car, like, oh, that's who it was. Oh. So um, we all experience that. You need to know the name and the face. Well, when you go into the Old Testament, very interesting, you find out that in the Old Testament, God revealed his name. He revealed it to Moses, Exodus 3, 14. God said to Moses, we know this, this is the passage of the burning bush. And Moses is saying, what name shall I give to tell them about the God who sent me? God says to Moses, tell them, I am who am. And he said, say this to the people of Israel, I am has sent me to you. And so what's revealed to us here is the name of God. And I think it's appropriate. You know, this, this is very much like in the Greek tradition, the one necessary being, the one whose essence is his existence, uh, the one who necessarily exists, who lives in uh, the eternal now neither future nor past, who was and is and is to come, as St. John uh, writes in Revelation, expanding on the idea of I am who am. 
So this is the name of God. But the face of God is not revealed in the Old Testament. Moses wanted to see the face. In Exodus 33, verse 18, uh, after making intercession, after making a kind of Christ-like intercession, in fact, to the to the Father, for the people of Israel, in which Moses even goes to the point of offering his life on behalf of Israel, but the Lord declines. And then Moses says to the Lord, I pray thee, show me thy glory. And he said, I will make all my goodness pass before you and will proclaim before you my name, the Lord, and I will be gracious to whom I will be gracious and will show mercy on whom I will show mercy. But, he said, you cannot see my face. For man shall not see me and live. And the Lord said, Behold, there is a place by me where you shall stand upon the rock. And while my glory passes by, I will put you in a cleft of the rock. I will cover you with my hand until I have passed by. Then I will take away my hand and you shall see my back. But my face shall not be seen. And that's the closest anyone in the Old Testament comes to seeing God. Oh, yeah, you know, you'll read in the book of Judges or in some of the prophets where, you know, somebody will see the angel of the Lord and they will say, I have seen God, or they'll see God in a vision. But we have to read the Old Testament according to the tradition which comes down to us from, uh, from Judaism before us and in the tradition of the church. And uh, standing on Exodus 33, the Jewish tradition unanimously held these other purported sightings of God that we have in various por- uh, places of the Old Testament, these were visionary. These were mediated okay, in various ways, through an angel, through a mental vision. But Moses came the closest, and he only saw God's back, which we don't know what that means. But it means in some way he saw God's presence without seeing it directly. And that's as close as anyone gets. See, communion with God in the garden, Adam and Eve walked with the Father in the cool of the day and presumably could gaze on his face. But through our sin in the garden, thereafter in the Old Testament, the face was withdrawn. And so we could say the drama of most of Scripture is the journey of man back to see the face of God. And David, one of the great saints of scripture, he articulates this desire to see God's face, the direct view of who God is. Psalm 27, 8, thou hast said, seek my face. My heart says to thee, thy face, Lord, do I seek. And again, Psalm 42, I'm missing verse 2 on the handout, but you're familiar with it. As a heart longs for flowing streams, so longs my soul for thee, O God. My soul thirsts for God, for the living God. When shall I come and behold the face of God? So David, on behalf of all the saints of the Old Testament, expresses this desire to see God's face. And yet the face of God remained hidden in these times. Hidden as we see in the tabernacle. Because in the tabernacle proper, which was a a tent divided into two sections, there was a curtain that divided the holy place from the holy of holies. And the direct presence of God remained enthroned above the wings of the cherubim, uh, above the ark, in the Holy of Holies. And there was no source of light. It was utter darkness behind the curtain. In front of the curtain, in the holy place, there was light with the lampstand and on the other side, the showbread, the 12 loaves of bread laid out on a golden table. And in the holy place there was light and there was an altar of incense which represented the prayers of the people. And the priest could enter there and make intercession and burn incense upon the altar. But there was no light when you went behind the curtain. And so... 
even though the divine presence was there, nothing could be seen. And that was symbolic of the reservation of the full revelation of God in the Old Testament. Now, as far as entrance into the Holy Holies went, only once a year did the high priest go back into the Holy of Holies. And that was on the holiest day of the liturgical calendar, the Day of Atonement, Yom Kippur. And on that day, the high priest would go back in behind the curtain into the utter darkness and there sprinkle blood upon the mercy seat for his own sins, for the sins of the priestly house, his brother priests, and for the sins of the whole people. And then when he would exit the Holy of Holies and the Holy, of, uh, Holy Place, he would walk out in, in later times, this was within the temple, walk out uh, into the temple courts, and there from a raised platform he would pronounce the priestly blessing for number six, of which are so familiar. This is our Old Testament reading on January 1st. Uh, so many times we've heard this proclaimed in the liturgy. Uh, but this is the priestly blessing. The Lord said to Moses, say to Aaron and his sons, thus shall you bless the people of Israel. You shall say to them, the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. Thus they shall place my name upon the people and I will bless them, the Lord says. So the name is proclaimed because the name had been revealed in the Old Testament. And the name was placed on the people. In fact, by the time of our Lord, this uh, ceremony on the Day of Atonement was the only time of the year when anyone in Israel would phonetically pronounce the name of the Lord. Okay? And every time that they heard the name of the Lord pronounced, they would prostrate. Okay? So here pronouncing the thousands gathered in the temple courts, drop. From which we get the practice of reverencing, the bow of the head, etc. At the holy name of our Lord. But in any event, uh, by the time of our Lord, this is the only time when the name was pronounced. But look, in addition to, place, to the mention of the name, there is also the mention of the face. Okay? Twice. Okay? In verse 25, the Lord make his face shine upon you. And in verse 26, lift up his countenance upon you. Now, I don't know why they translate it differently in the English, but in the Hebrew, in both cases, it's the face. The Lord lift up his face upon you is literally what verse 26 says. But here, in these verses, it's expressed as a wish. May the Lord do this for you. But the face is not revealed in the Old Covenant. It is the coming of Christ, then, that is the answer to this prayer for blessing uttered by the high priest on the Day of Atonement every year. And we can see such a profound prophetic aspect to that. After having made atonement with the blood of bulls and goats which cannot wash away sin. The high priest would exit and bless the people with essentially a prayer that at some point God would make his face to shine upon them. And that happens when the one who can make atonement comes and shows his face. And St. John is so excited about it that he writes about it at the beginning of his gospel. No one has ever seen God. Everybody knows what that is. That's a put down on Moses. Hey, Moses, you're pretty good, man, but sorry. Never saw him. Saw the promised land. Never saw God. No one has ever seen God. But the only begotten Son who is in the bosom of the Father, he has made him known. This is great stuff. And that's why when you read through the introduction to the Gospel of John, there's all this seeing that goes on as the first disciples are being called. Uh, they ask him, Rabbi, where do you stay? In verse 39, he says to them, come and see they came and saw where he was staying. They stayed with him that day, for it was about the tenth hour. Nathaniel said to him later in that same chapter, Can anything good come out of Nazareth? <coughs> Excuse me, Nazareth? Philip says to him, Come and see. Nathaniel comes. Jesus speaks to him. Uh, Here is an Israelite in whom is no guile, etc. 
And he says, you are the king of Israel. And Jesus answered him, because I said to you, I saw you under the fig tree, do you believe? You shall see greater things than these. Truly, truly, I say to you, you will see heaven opened. <coughs> so in the Gospel of John, the apostle, at the end of his life, is still so excited about the coming of Jesus, in which we can see the face of God and our desires from, old, from the old covenant can finally be satisfied. That he writes in all this seeing, all through his gospel, culminating, of course, in the climax of the passage we read at the beginning. Jesus said to him, have I been with you so long and yet you do not know me, Philip? Philip might have probably felt pretty bad at this point. All sitting around the Last Supper. And uh, nobody really wants to ask any questions. But, you know, Philip screws up the courage. He's going to ask, I, I don't really know where you're going. Don't you know me, Philip? Ooh, ouch. <laughs> Been taking classes for three years and uh, apparently haven't gotten the basics down. Okay. Uh, burned. James is snickering over there. <laughs> See, I know better, Philip. I don't ask questions. <laughs> anyway, poor Philip. But I'm glad he asked the question. Because it gives the Lord opportunity to teach us. Jesus said to him, have I been with you so long and yet you do not know me, Philip? He who has seen me has seen the Father. How can you say, show us the Father? So at last the cry of David, the cry of Moses is answered in the face of Christ. Now, what, is this, what does this mean? Does this mean that just looking at Jesus you had instantaneous knowledge of, of the mystery of God? Obviously not, because our Lord in his physical body walked all around Israel. Many people looked at him and completely did not get the message. So even when our Lord is speaking at the Last Supper, he has seen me, has seen the Father. To truly see the Father required something more, amen? Something more than simply physical sight. Even there it required faith. You know, sometimes people, and I have students like this, they think, oh, if I could have just been back in uh, the times when our Lord was walking around Israel... You know, then it would have been easy to believe. Not necessarily. Okay. He didn't look like God. Okay. He had no form or comeliness that we should be drawn to him, right? There were challenges to faith when the Lord was walking among us. How can that man who can be scarred and who can be wounded and who can experience hunger, etc. And says challenging things that we don't always understand. How can he be God? Okay. That's pretty tough to believe. Actually, in millennia of hindsight and reflection, there's in some ways we have greater clarity and there's, there's some motives for easier belief now when we've had a chance to ponder. But it's always been an act of faith. And to see the Father in the face of Jesus has always required something more than physical sight. But our Lord proclaimed at the Last Supper, He who sees me has seen the Father. But what does that mean? What does that do for us now? Okay, Because he's ascended. It's like, Oh, that was nice. <laughs> the cry of the man of the Old Testament was answered for 33 years. Okay. And now we're back to square one, right? Okay. So how do we see the face of the Father now? Well, you know, it's interesting. The way that we see the face of the Father through the face of Christ was actually prefigured already in the Old Testament. Because as I said... The, the divine presence remained in the obscurity of the darkness of the Holy of Holies. But in the holy place there was light. That light was provided by the lampstand. The, uh, the seven uh, flames of the menorah. And of course we know that in the New Testament, the flaming fire of the menorah becomes a symbol of Holy Spirit. And at Pentecost, when the tongues of flame come down, I mean, this is my speculation, okay? I think God was making a menorah out of the apostles. Okay? Twelve candlesticks, okay? Of the Holy Spirit illuminating the divine presence. But in the light of the Holy Spirit, which operates with our faith, what were you able to see in the holy place? Able to see the bread of the presence, in my old King James when I was growing up, that's all we used when I was growing up. If it was good enough for St. Paul, it's good enough for us, King James. <laughs> that's our 
old school Protestant tradition. We use the King James, they call it the shoe, the shoe bread. Okay? But in Hebrew, it's the lechem hapanim. Okay? Let me write that down. You can go back and use this. Get your money's worth out of the conference. Lechem hapanim, bread of the face. The bread of the presence was the bread of God's face. What? Bread in which we can see the face of God? Why 12 loaves of it? It's the mystical body of Israel, God's people. And in the light of the flame of the Holy Spirit, you were able to see the bread of the presence of God. Oh, that's interesting. Wonder where this is going. <laughs> Let me point something out interesting in John 14 on the front of, uh, front of our outline. In verse 8, Philip says to him, Lord, show us the Father and we shall be satiated. There's only one other place in the Gospel of John where this particular Greek word for satisfaction is used. Want to guess? John 6, I heard it. Yes, that's right. The feeding of the 5,000. And what is the context, by the way, for this discourse where Jesus is talking about seeing his face? (laughs) <laughs> yeah. Okay. Instituting the Eucharist. All right. And so it's in Christ who leaves his presence with us in the Holy Eucharist that we continue to see his face and through him the face of the Father. And not only John points that out, but as we all know, in that famous passage... In Luke 24, walking on the road to Emmaus, he comes along beside them, and they're still in the old covenant. He hides his face from them, right? They don't recognize him. So the the old covenant status has not yet been released for them. So they walk along, and he breaks open the scriptures to them as they walk, you know, as a prototype of the mass, the liturgy of the word preceding Uh, the liturgy of the Eucharist, which is coming. And he breaks open the scriptures. And uh, as we find out later, their hearts burned within them, right? Charismatic heartburn. (laughs) Hearts burn within him as he's breaking open the word, because as he's breaking open the word, he's helping them to make the transition from the old to the new. And then evening comes, and he makes like he's going on. They say, no, stay with us. The day is long progressed. They bring him into the home. They sit down at the meal. He takes bread. He breaks. He blesses using words from the institution narrative. And as we read here in Luke 24, 30, when he was at table with them, he took the bread and blessed and broke it and gave it to them. And their eyes were opened. And they recognized him, the bread of the face. And then he vanished out of their sight. Why does the apparition cease? Why does, it, why does he vanish from their sight when the bread is broken? Of course, because the bread of the face has now been given to him. His presence will remain with them forever in the Holy Eucharist. And so it is for us. At every celebration of Mass, it always strikes me. What are we commanded to do? At the high point of Mass, what are we commanded to do? Behold! Gaze! Always strikes me. This is the answer to the cry of the human heart. Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. And behind the Lamb of God, we see the heart and the face of the Father. Who loved us so much to give up that Lamb Son. Which struck him to his very heart. That is the beauty. That is the beauty of the Mass. Why does Jesus leave his presence to, a, to us as bread? I think there's, there could be great fruit for meditation on this. Why is bread uh, the face of God in the New Covenant? Okay. Again, we know it's not just physical sight. Many look at the physical Eucharist and are not converted and are not persuaded. So I think if they sit long enough, they'll get a sunburn and come around. But... Um, 
But many see the Eucharist. It, so it, it, took an, it takes eyes of faith, but let's remember, it always has taken eyes of faith, even when our Lord was present in his, in his uh, uh, physical body during the 33 years. Always taken faith. But what does it mean that God leaves his face to us in bread? So let's think about the nature of bread. What is bread? Well, it's people food. Animals don't eat bread. They don't make bread. So bread is a very particular kind of substance. It's a substance uh, made for human nourishment. And there's profound meditation in that. Uh, we do not live by bread alone, but by every word that comes forth from the mouth of God. It's God who gives himself to us as nourishment. Uh, bread is the most fundamental food in most cultures. So God gives himself to us as our fundamental source of life. Bread doesn't kill you. You can't be stabbed by bread. Okay. It'd be pretty hard to kill anybody by beating them over the head with bread. Okay. You know the only way you can die of bread? By refusing to eat it. So that tells us something about the nature of God. Okay. Where does death come from? Death comes from turning away from him. Turning away from the free offer. The free offer of life. And you know, as I was meditating on bread in preparation for the talk, it occurred to me, you know, bread is very approachable. Bread is very non-threatening. They never make horror movies about bread. <laughs> no? You're watching, and the heroine hears a thump in the closet. So she gets up, of course she's going to investigate, right? She starts walking across the room, reaching for the knob of the closet. She opens, it's a loaf of wheat bread! Ah! <laughs> never have movies like that. <laughs> they make movies about killer tomatoes, but... Uh, uh, personally, if I find broccoli intimidating, but uh, <laughs> and let's not even go into zucchini. But, but bread, it, it is so approachable. The welcoming heart of the Father, okay? The Father from whom no sin can exclude us. Sin is self-exclusion. Sin is refusal to come and to be nourished. But the Father loves us so much. The Father has provided everything for our nourishment. There's a humility about bread as well. You know, it's not a wedding cake. It's not filet mignon. It's not gray poupon. Right? It's not a, yeah, you know, creme brulee. So there's a humility which speaks to us about the humility of Christ, which reveals to us something profound again about the nature of God, the heart of the Father. So we can make our own meditation. This is something that we can do in prayer and think, why is it in the providence of God that he reveals himself through the face of bread? But, uh, but fathers and brothers, this, this day, let us understand that there is only one way to the Father. And that's no arrogant statement because nobody else even claims it. It's not even being sold by any other booth. The one way to the Father is through Christ. He showed us the face. Not only the name, but the face, the character, the love, the virtues, the nature. So we don't just have a description. But we understand the person. We don't just visen, but we can in who God is. We enter into communion with him. And he has not left us without his face. But in the mass that we will celebrate in a few moments at this conference, we are going to be commanded yet once again to behold the face of God in his sacramental presence. May God grant us the grace to see the face of the Father through Christ's Eucharistic presence, which will remain till we see him face to face in glory. Amen. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen.